What is up everybody, Daki, and today I'm going to talk about how to choose an amplifier for your needs, whether it's a PA amplifier, home power amplifier for your speakers, or a car amplifier for your subwoofer. So just disclaimer, this video is going to be focusing on car and home amplifiers rather than guitar amps or home theatre receivers, but the information does transfer. So you can keep watching to learn a bit more about some of their function. So I'm going to be splitting this up into contents budgets, so how to divvy up your money, uh, power for the amplifier and the amplifier puts out, the job and space it needs to fill, features that the amplifier could do with, and the signs of a high quality amplifier. So step one is the budget. You need to choose a balance between what you spend on your amplifier, what you spend on your subs or speakers. If you've already got speakers or sub, then that's fantastic. You can just focus all your money towards the amp. But if you want to learn a bit more, feel free to keep watching. If not, skip to the next part. So the cost should be roughly a one to one, but it does vary depending on the amount you want to spend. If you don't want to spend much, then spend a bit more on the amplifier than the sub. Uh, it doesn't matter, these numbers are relative, so it doesn't matter if they're Canadian rubles, American pesos, or Australian dumplings. It's all relative. So if you want to spend $45, then $55 is good for an amp. But if you're spending a bit more, say up here, you're spending quite a bit more on the amplifier than the subs. But by the time you get to the pointy end, you're spending a lot more on the speakers than the amplifiers. Now the reason why is because down here you've just got a limited choice, it's as simple as that. Once you have a bit more money, you can afford to protect your speakers. You can afford to get a better amplifier that won't set your speakers on fire if it faults. And by the time you get up to the pointy end up here, uh, you get into the diminishing returns area for sound quality amplifiers. Chances are they're already very pure sounding by the 1K mark. So by the time you get up here, you're sure you can spend a bit more money, but you should be focusing your budget towards good speakers. And also for high power amplifiers, they also get cheaper per watt up in the top range. And uh, just a conversion, by the way, this area here is 1K total, and this is 1K each. So if you've got 160,000 rubles, spend roughly 80K on speakers or subs, and the other 80K on amplifiers. So this is roughly, so these are just some currency conversions. This one here, by the way, is the Brazilian rare, real, or real, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. So choose your sub first or choose your speakers first then choose the speak the amplifier for the speaker if you need some help with this you can check out my choosing the right subwoofer video for some tips so choose the speakers and then choose the amplifier for the speakers so step two power you need to work out what power requirements the speaker has so what power or impedance is the speaker and how many channels or speakers are you going to drive now there's many different ways of driving multiple speakers. Uh, you can have one channel per speaker, such as this. This is a four times 100 watt amplifier, and these are four speakers, which are say 100 watts each. This is perfect. These are what the amplifiers are built for. You get 400 watts total, and you get one channel per say door of your car. If you want a bit more loudness out of it, what you could do is you could put each of these four ohm speakers in parallel per channel. What this will end up doing is you get more area, which leads to more efficiency from the speakers, and you'll also get more power out of the amplifier. If the amplifier is safe to run two ohms, you can run two parallel per speaker. You can get a whopping 600 watts total at double the efficiency. So this would be much louder than the previous setup, this one right here. Or, of course, you could get a pair of higher quality, maybe less efficient speakers, and you can bridge the amplifier to drive more power into each of these speakers. So right here, if an amplifier can do 4 times 150 watts at 2 ohms, and can bridge, it'll do 2 times 300 watts at 4 ohms. So this is another option you could go for. And of course, the final option is you could go from four channels all the way down to a single driver. If you've got a two ohm subwoofer, then you have the option to bridge both channels of the amplifier and then run one bridge channel per voice coil of the sub. So a four times 100 watt amplifier goes into a single 600 watt subwoofer. 
Now, alternatively, you could do the opposite of that. You could get a single 600 watt at one ohm amplifier and you could run four times 150 watts RMS into four ohm speakers. So each of these speakers are 150 watts at four ohms and you can see that the power comes through and it's all split into parallel and this amplifier can output 600 watts into these four speakers. But keep in mind, if you go with this option, you only get one channel. So you don't get a left and right, you only get a single mono channel, which means you'll either need two amplifiers for a stereo setup, or you'll need to work out something else. Now, something else you'll need to consider is if you want to run the speakers at the RMS power, or if you want to slightly overrate the amplifier. Overrating the amplifier is a way to squeeze out a bit more sound quality from a lot of speakers right up the top end as amplifiers usually distort as soon as they go above their RMS power, but speakers don't. So you'll need to make sure that an amplifier can do at least the RMS power of the speaker you've chosen, and also need to make sure you can drive the rated speaker impedance. Say a 4 ohm minimum amplifier can't drive a 2 ohm speaker unless you risk the amplifier damaging itself and voiding warranties. So the first example I'll go with is a 1 ohm 500 watt speaker running off a 1 ohm 1000 watt amplifier. Now what you get here is what's known as overhead. You get voltage overhead and what that means is if there's ever a particularly large kick that comes through the amplifier it will nicely go into the speaker rather than clipping and distorting so this is a good sound quality option. Now the other option is to get a 500 watt speaker and a 1000 watt amplifier except a 2 ohm amplifier and a 4 ohm speaker. Now what this will mean is that you're only running the amplifier at half its rated current which means the amp runs cooler and more efficiently but it means that you won't get the voltage overhead that you got before. But the trade-off is the system is now expandable. You could potentially in the future get a second 500 watt speaker or subwoofer and you could instantly make the system six decibels louder, just like that. So step three, job or space the amplifier has to fit. You need to think about the environment, uh, how the amplifier fits into it, if it needs to be waterproof or anything like that, uh, particularly heat resistant, possibly you need to do some environmental changes and where it's going to be mounted. So you'll need to consider if you want to mount it under the car seat, you need to make sure that the measurements fit under the car seat. You'll need to measure these yourself. Uh, or you could just mount it straight to the box, make sure it doesn't vibrate so you need some standoffs. Panel mount into the box. Is it a replacement for a home theater sub or a PA subwoofer that you're going with or are you building your own? So this is another form factor of amplifier that you could consider. Rack mount is a rack mount amplifier. Have you got other rack mount stuff? And if you get a rack, you could just slap everything in the rack and have a nice tidy setup. Water resistant or marine rated? Is it rated for salt? Is it rated for splashes? Is it going to survive in a boat? Most amplifiers know, so if you're doing boating, then you'll definitely need to look for specifically a marine rated amplifier. If you want to use a regular car amp, you'd need to put it in a sealed box and chances are in order to get no water flow, it'll get no airflow either and then it could overheat or other salt could get into it if you're still pumping air through. So you need to get a marine rated amplifier for boating use. Also, is it got to run for a long time? Do you need it to be reliable? Does it need to be a reliable pro audio amplifier with a high uh, duty cycle? or does it require active cooling? If you're tucking it away, will you need to get fans for it? Will it get adequate cooling where you're putting it? These are things that you need to consider for your own scenario. So in summary, ensure the amplifier fits into the space, has sufficient cooling, has enough power, be it um, 12 volt or 240 volt or 120 volt, whatever you're going with, 415 volt even, and make sure it survives in the environment and doesn't get wet or corrode. And now we'll talk about amplifier features. Now, most of these features here are 
I didn't mention before because features before need to come with the amplifier whereas all these features right here uh, you can usually tack them on outside for example a DSP has only just recently come integrated into the amplifier and before that you'd need to buy one externally. So I'm going to go through what all these different features mean and, and hopefully with the information I give you you can decide whether or not they'd be useful for your needs. So high pass and low pass come pretty standard on amplifiers which are designed for both subwoofers and mid ranges and well, tweeters by extension. What this allows you to do is it allows you to roll off the bass going into mid-range speakers or roll off the treble going into subs in order to get the desired frequencies to the desired speakers. It also protects the speakers and makes it sound a lot better. This is usually what it looks like on the amplifier, so a switch with high, low or off or sometimes just low or off and then nearby a knob usually with 50 or 500 hertz that you can change this to. Most of the time crossover is adjustable so you can choose a specific frequency that you want to cross over at. And here you can see the results. This would be set around 100 hertz and in a good amplifier with a 24 dB per octave crossover you would get a dramatically reduced bass going to your mid-range speakers so they can run with more power safely. If you were to switch this to low right now, it would be the mirror opposite where it would cross over at 100 hertz again, except go down, and that would protect your sub from mid-range going into it, which would make it sound a lot better and potentially get a bit more power out of it also. So these are very useful features if you're not going to be crossing it over externally. Now the next one is subsonic filter. You can see that it's very similar to the last one. In fact, I use the same graph and all the knobs and that are in the same spot, except they've got different words. And that's because they are essentially the same, except subsonic filter is focused on low frequencies. It is a high pass that works at very low frequencies. And what it does is it protects your ported subwoofer from going too low. When you run a ported subwoofer below its tuning, the speaker can move a ton and if you're putting too much power into it the speaker can damage itself and you don't get any output so you've just damaged the speaker for no reason so subsonic filter can be a very useful feature i wish it came on more amplifiers but unfortunately it doesn't but it is incredibly useful for making sure your subs don't blow themselves up Something else is often subsonic filters are just an on off switch and it will say on off at 30 hertz. So if you switch it on, then it will cut off at 30 hertz, which would be about here. And if you switch it off, then it just remains flat all the way down to wherever the amplifier starts to cut out. So this is more of a protection feature for subwoofers than a sound quality feature. Now the next one, uh, phase shift. Uh, I believe I've noticed this one becoming less common as DSPs are becoming more common. This is a simple way to get back uh, losses from phase shift. So what happens is, say you've got two speakers here. This one's putting out its waves, this one's putting out its waves, high pressure, low pressure, high low, high low. By the time it gets the ear, these are what's known as out of phase. So this leaves as risk destructive interference which is a cancellation or a null and what it leads to is a very hollow sound and no real bass it just sounds like knocking against wood rather than a big pressure so this is a null right here it would be plenty loud but right here you are getting cancellation so how do you fix that well by doing a phase shift so amplifiers, say for example this one right here, instead of starting going up, it now starts going down, up, down, up, down, and then they both end down at the head right here. So these two add up to create a bigger one, and now you're experiencing constructive interference. Now modern time alignment is more useful than this, but often where, say, the speaker and the subwoofer crossover, say at about 80 hertz, uh, this can be quite common uh, cancellation happening so just adjusting the phase can sometimes get that back if you find that you've had to turn up your sub or mid-range speakers a ton at say the crossover frequency 
and you have a phase shift knob, uh, this is something you could experiment yourself if you've already got an amp and are looking for upgrading an amp because you want to get more out of it. It could just be cancelling. Now the next feature is one that I really like when it's in the amplifier itself, which is a speed line converter. It makes it really easy to add an amplifier to a stock head unit. All you have to do is tap into the signal leads between the head unit and the door speakers, uh, route them into the amplifier and then the amplifier just boosts that signal and does maybe a low pass to a sub to make sure you've got that feature on the amplifier too and then that goes off to the sub and that's a super easy way to integrate a sub to a factory system. I've done it before multiple times with quite good results. So this is often all you have to go for. You don't need a fancy head unit. You don't need a fancy speaker line converter or a fancy DSP. Uh, this can be as simple as this to get good enough results. Now, one of the more modern features we see in amplifiers these days are inbuilt DSPs. Uh, these are really cool. I love my DSP because it's made my stock Mazda system sound absolutely amazing. <laughs> It's uh, back in the old Mazda. I absolutely loved it. It was so pleasant to listen to. Uh, what you can do with DSP is, as I mentioned before, with phase, you can do time alignment. So if one speaker is closer to you than another, you can move it backward by delaying it. And then it will sound like it is further away and you can get it to sound like it's the same distance away, which means that there's no cancellation and it creates a nice sound stage. But something else you can do, or more commonly advertised, is frequency response compensation. So right here you've got what the speaker sounds like without any adjustment. What you can do is you can apply a correction, you can lift up where it's quiet, you can drop down where it's loud, and you can get out the end your desired response. Now keep in mind this can perform magic tricks, but it can't perform raw miracles. You're not going to all of a sudden perform hair tricks with a sealed 10 inch sub, unfortunately. Now a really cool feature I'm looking forward to becoming more common is Bluetooth, but maybe not for the reasons you think. Now Bluetooth is a very easy way to make a portable boombox. All you need is a speaker, an amplifier, a box and a battery, and you've got a really easy DIY boombox. But something else that I'm looking forward to seeing in the future or doing for a build, which is if I or one of my friends ever has a car with the battery in the back, uh, what I could possibly do is mount a Bluetooth module in the dash connected to the head unit and then it sends the signal up to the amplifier without having to run cables through the car and if the battery is already in the back of the car it'll make installing a sub so easy. It'll be absolutely incredible just how easy it'll make it and I'm really looking forward to hopefully getting an opportunity to do a build like that one day where it takes literally minutes to go from no sub to sub completely installed because all I've got to do is take apart the dash, hook something up and then just plug it in in the back and that's it. No trim removal or no major trim removal necessary. Oh, that'd be absolutely fantastic. So this is, I haven't seen a build like that yet, but I really want to see one like that in the future where they use a Bluetooth amplifier and a Bluetooth transceiver from the head unit just to skip all that part. Now the good old trusty bass knob, most amplifiers have that. Some bass knobs even are Bluetooth these days, but the perform, the job of a bass knob is most subs are louder than stock systems and a lot of people add subs to their stock systems. So what you'll want to do is you'll want to be able to have it quieter for when you just want to listen to music by yourself on the commute home and you want to be able to crank it when you want to demo it. So that's the job of a bass knob. It just goes up the front, uh, maybe near the head unit or down beside the driver and the driver can just turn up or down the bass depending on their needs. Uh, some amps don't come with this, but it is definitely really cool if your sub is way louder than your system. Or else you'd have to turn it up and down on the head unit, which can be a pain in the ass, especially if you see flashing lights behind you. Debug lights have also become uh, more common and more various. So it's very common for there just to be a fault light or a protect light on an amplifier, but now we're seeing a wide range, including voltage. So if it's under vaulted or over vaulted to the amp, say 17 or eight volts, then a voltage light will come on. Uh, 
temperature light, if the amps are overheated, shorting, if the outputs have shorted or the voice coil in the sub is blown, it'll automatically protect itself from that. And clipping lights, which is very useful for what I'm about to show you. Uh, clipping lights are incredibly useful for setting how loud your amplifier is. Now amplifiers, you can keep turning them up, but they'll only get so loud. But what happens when you turn them up is it starts to square off the top of the wave, just like here and here. And what happens, it creates these nasty, nasty sharp edges, which can damage tweeters and sometimes mid ranges. So clipping is very bad for mid range speakers, but it's also not very good for subs as it creates a lot more heat and power into subs for only a tiny bit louder. So if you've got clipping lights, you know where to stop turning it up other than just feeding heat into your subwoofer for no particular reason. It's also a lot easier to set gains using clipping lights than it is to use an oscilloscope as for a lot of people an oscilloscope will be as much as their entire system costs. So it can be hard to get something like an oscilloscope and maybe none of your friends are an electrical engineer so you don't have access to an oscilloscope so clipping lights are really cheap and a really easy way of setting gains when they gum stock with the amplifier. And now possibly the most overlooked feature on an amplifier or maybe the most shunned feature, probably not the most overlooked, but it's the humble bass boost. This feature, say this is the stock output of a car head unit after it goes through the speaker line converter, usually start to lose low frequencies. But what you can do is you can use a bass boost in order to get back some 50 hertz. I don't know why it's 50 or 40. I don't know why they didn't do 20 or 30. They did 50. I don't know why amplifiers do this. It drives me crazy. The option would actually be useful if it did lower frequencies, but instead they choose 50, which is where most subs peak anyway. Oh, it is frustrating. But yeah, it just it just makes it louder here. That's it. It doesn't make it louder down low. It doesn't make it louder up high. If it made it louder the whole way, it would be gain. No, this is just a big lump right in the middle and you can choose how sharp that lump is depending on how far around this is turned. So virtually a useless feature and I'd only really suggest using it if turning up the gain to max is not enough for some reason and you couldn't be bothered installing other amplifier or speaker line converter then you can just crank the bass boost. Uh, also, as I mentioned before, uh, right near the start of the video, uh, bridging. Bridging can be very useful for getting a lot of volts out of amplifiers. And a lot of volts out of amplifiers is useful for driving home audio things in a car audio environment. Say for example, you've got a 2 times 100 watt 4 ohm amp bridge that delivers 200 watts into 8 ohms. A 1000 watt or 1 ohm amplifier only delivers 125 watts into 8 ohms. So you can get a lot more power by going smart with a 2 times 100 watt amp rather than brute forcing it and just getting the most powerful amp you can. So this is something to consider if you're running an 8 ohm sub. Many multi-channel amps automatically bridge, so that's quite a neat feature. It's, it's free, you may as well. And with this, if you've got a 4 channel amplifier, you can bridge two of the channels together for a really mean 2.1 channel setup which I have done before and I've had some really good results. And strapping, which is the same as bridging, except it's instead of two channels from the same amplifier, it's two amplifiers which are a single channel each. Amplifiers that allow strapping uh, can be connected to each other, as you can see right here, negative to positive on one of the amplifiers. One of them's listed as master and the other one set as slave. It'll say it in the manual but this is effectively bridging except on a bigger scale. As I mentioned before, you can get a ton more volts out of an amplifier. You only get the double the power, but you get double the volts, but it is the same current, but you get double the volts. So if you've got a 10,000 watt at one ohm amplifier or two of them and you strap them together, you get 20,000 watts into two ohms, which is the same voltage as 40,000 watts into one ohm. Now, what's this useful for? Why not just get a single 20,000 watt amplifier? Well, for people doing SPL competition, uh, they need as much voltage as possible to fight through impedance rise 
So strapping amplifiers is a really good way of getting as much voltage as possible. So that's why you don't see this very often because mostly the only people that do it are SPL competition guys because these setups are less reliable, can be unbalanced, one amp can be doing more work than the other and the minimum impedance is doubled. As I mentioned up here, 20 kilowatts at 2 ohms equivalent to 40 kilowatts at 1 ohm. It can't actually do 40 kilowatts at 1 ohm. It's very likely that the amplifiers would be damaged by trying to do this. So in summary, get the features that you need for your setup. Make sure you go through and you think logically, step from the head unit, from the battery to the amplifier and think about what features you need. Now, step five, signs of a good amplifier. These include brand, specs, power connectors and fuses and the amplifier class. Brand, pretty simple. Just go with a brand with a good reputation in the community. Uh, the more you see it reps, the more it's probably going to be a high quality reliable amplifier as people that have amps die on them are less likely to present them <laughs> pretty simple so just have a look and see what's out there and see what people are repping uh, not necessarily uh, try to avoid seeing sponsored posts or advertisements as but you can probably tell the difference so just look for what people have in say cheaper show cars rather than the more expensive ones which chances are could be sponsored. Now on to specs. So we're going to have a look at specs of amplifiers and compare them and get an idea of what these three different amplifiers are. So these are the specs of three different amplifiers. You can see 20 hertz, 20 kilohertz, plus or minus 3 dB. Uh, that means this has a delta of 6 dB so that's not very good. 10 hertz to 350 hertz. Ooh, 350 hertz, that might not be as good, but it's only 3 dB, so that's not too bad. DC to 400 kilohertz, that is a huge range, minus 10 dB, not fantastic, but 8 hertz to 40 kilohertz minus 3 dB, that's sounding pretty good. So you can tell here that this amplifier is not good, and this amplifier is very good. This one right here in the middle is uh, yet to be seen. It's only got a small variance, but it doesn't go up that high. So next we'll have a look at total harmonic distortion. 400 watts at 10% THD. Uh oh. Okay, 10% THD is most likely audible, unless they're complete garbage speakers. So chances are you don't want to go off this one, as they're just trying to get the biggest, most inflated power number they can out of it. Chances are there's a PMPO number. Ignore PMPO. PMPO, trash, garbage. Max or peak is bad, but PMPO is the king of trash. Now the second amplifier, 3500 watts of 1% THD. Ah, now it makes more sense. This is a subwoofer amplifier, hence why it only goes up to 350 hertz. A subwoofer or bass shaker. So that makes a lot more sense. So it probably is a good amplifier. Now the third option, 50 watts, oh geez, that's not much at all, that must be garbage, at 0.05% total harmonic distortion. Wow, that's really low. 100 watts at 1% total harmonic distortion, yeah, okay, now we're starting to get the idea. This amplifier right here, chances are, is a very high quality uh, transistor amplifier, hence why it can do the DC here. So very high quality amplifier indeed. And you can see the ratings, it has two different ratings here, just like it had two different frequency responses. That's because uh, if you want three decibels of overhead peak, it will be producing instead of 0.05%, 1% THD when it peaks up to 100 watts. And it might become audible at maybe 120 watts. So that's why they've given a broader number here. So this is effectively its peak power here, whereas this is what they want to consider its RMS power here. Signal to noise ratio. Now signal to noise ratio is basically the difference between the amplifier not getting any signal and the amplifier getting max signal. So say you had a 160 decibel demo car. This amplifier right here means that if there's no signal going to the amplifier, the subs will be producing 80 decibels of background hum. So 160 minus 80 is 80 decibels. This one here, 100 decibels for the sub amp, means it'll be producing 60. 160 minus 100 is 60 decibels of background hum. 
This one right here, 120 decibels. This is really good. 160 minus 120 is only 40 decibels of background hum, which is virtually inaudible. It is background noise. So this thing right here, even in an incredibly efficient SPL vehicle, you would not, you would be very pinned to try to find any audible distortion or any audible hiss. Yeah, ignore PMPO, it's just complete garbage. Now, signs of a good amplifier as well are the power connectors and fuses. If the power connectors or fuses are only like a 10 amp cable and it's designed to run 100,000 watts, chances are you can't run 100,000 watts so it's line. So look for amps that have chunky power connectors if they're supposed to do big watts and have big fuses if they're supposed to do it also. You should be looking at fuses and power connectors rate at roughly the amplifier power divided by 12. So a 1200 watt amp should be able to take a 100 amp or 4 gauge cable and should be able to have a 100 amp fuse in it as well or to 50 amp fuses but some high power amps might not have fuses but yeah just for an example uh, we can see rated current 8 gauge right here rated power at 12 volts 50 times 12 600 watts so it's very unlikely that a 300 watt amp with an 8 gauge power cable input is able to do 3000 watts highly unlikely so what you want to look for right here is look for what power the amplifier is rated for. Say if it's 8,000 watts, then it should have two zero gauge inputs. If it's a 1200 watt, as I mentioned before, four gauge. Similar thing for the output of an amplifier. If an output's rated to deliver its power at one ohm, say a four gauge power cable out or two eight gauges out is roughly what's needed for a 10 kilowatt amplifier. And for a 2500 watt, say rack mount amplifier, it will need 25 amp cable if its output is 2500 watts at four ohms. And now the very last thing I'll talk about, which these days is not as important as it used to be, is classes. So these are all the classes that I'm aware of. We've got class A, A, B, B, which is just bad, uh, class D amplifiers, but we're going to be focusing on mainly class AB FET amplifiers for cars and class D which involve half bridge and full bridge. So right here, class AB, class D. Class AB benefits, tried and tested, been around since the 80s. They were the first high power amps after valves. Uh, they're analog, so they're usually better for sound quality and they're cheaper because they've been around for so long. The boards are copied and pasted forever all the boards out right now have probably been around since the 90s but they are less efficient and hotter they're larger they're up to 10 times the size of their equivalent class d amplifiers which is ridiculous and they're less likely to have the new features since they've got older circuit boards or more likely to have old circuit boards they're less likely to have the modern features such as inbuilt dsp and bluetooth and things like that. in comparison class d smaller more efficient way more efficient they consume or burn up to four or five times less power than their class a b counterparts which means they can have four or five times smaller heat sinks or ten times smaller sometimes with fans added as well uh, higher power options exist you can get up to forty thousand watts uh, for a class D pretty comfortably these days they exist whereas the biggest class AB amplifier you'd find is probably 2000 maybe 4000 watts but they'd be getting very expensive and they're more likely to have the newer features but the low power options are more expensive uh, due to compactification making things more expensive a very a low power class D amplifier is likely to be about the size of a five cent coin and because of that it's going to have billions of dollars of engineering put into it so it's very ex expensive so it's probably cheaper to go with a class ab 200 watt amplifier than a class d 200 watt amplifier and also lower sound quality these days you probably couldn't tell but if you've got very high resolving speakers and you don't need a ton of power you're probably better off going with class ab still so there are also two types of class D. There's what's known as half bridge and full bridge, AKA Korean and Brazilian or Chinese respectively, although both are made in China. And just to summarize that, 
Uh, half bridge is overbuilt, which means usually they can take more abuse, but they're also larger and more expensive because they've got more components in them. Whereas full bridge are smaller, uh, lighter, more efficient. So they're like super class Ds, but they can't handle being wired below their rated in pins as components are already pushed closer to their limits. And because of that, they're all, they also tend to be less efficient. So that's something to keep in mind too, whether you want to go for a more premium option, uh, half bridge, or if you want to go for a more cost efficient full bridge. So in summary, budget, make sure you spend the budget, uh, divvy it up correctly. Step two, power, make sure you've got sufficient power for the speakers at their radiant pins. Step three, make sure the amplifier is suitable for the job and space that it's going into. Step four, make sure it has all the features that will make your life easy that you don't need to buy later for more money. And step five, make sure the amplifier is reliable and has the signs of quality and has consumer trust and has reliable specs certified by the community too in order to get a best possible amplifier. So thanks for watching, hopefully you learned something. Uh, if you did, leave a like, subscribe for more content, and check out my channel for more similar videos, including the one mentioned earlier, which is choosing the right speaker or subwoofer. And leave any questions you've got in the comments. I answer most questions. You can literally say, hey, I want a 2000 watt amp, and chances are I'll copy and paste a link to something into you. Uh, but it's, I really would appreciate if you did the research yourself for once. You know who you are about to type that comment in right now. But yeah, thanks for watching. See ya.